So my name is Helen Lazowski. Thank you for coming to my workshop, Full House, which is really awesome. I may run out of handouts, but that might not be a problem. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you very roughly, all the orange ones on here are exercises. I did warn you you're going to have to work, but it's only mental thinking, a little bit of imagination. You're going to have to come up with ideas and solutions and scenarios. So it's not difficult, but it's not a passive experience. There will be all the orange, all the yellow bits are me talking about stuff, and then we'll do a bit of a practice on it. <coughs> so I'm going to start by telling you what this isn't. This session is not about silver bullets. You're not going to walk out of here and be able to fix everything. That still comes down to hard work. What this is going to do is give you some tools and some techniques, maybe a bit of structure for you to better understand how and why habits form and to understand their anatomy so that you can insert a lever and maybe just move them slightly so that you can influence change. Now, can I have a show of hands here, please, for anybody? Has anybody here got no coaching experience whatsoever? OK, can I talk to you two at the end afterwards here, please? The reason I say that is because for those of you with coaching experience, you will notice me walking a very thin line between influence and what could be seen as manipulation. So with coaching experience, I'm trusting the inner coach in every single one of you to use your powers for good and not evil, please. I'm sure that's a quote from somewhere. Talking of quotes, we had lots of quotes from Einstein and sensible people from Gerd earlier this morning. My inspiration comes from Lieutenant Columbo. This was actually, you know, Saturday afternoon TV. Uh, people don't usually forget to do things they usually do, and I was had TV on in the background and that jumped out at me and I was like, oh my God, that's exactly, that's exactly what happens in real life. People don't forget to do things they usually do. And this workshop was born. This was a workshop I'd been looking to find a way of talking about. And this one comment from Saturday Afternoon TV did it. So I'm sorry in advance. Okay, I have a whole load of notes here. Forgive me, it's just to make sure that I cover everything that I want to say. So... If it was as easy as saying, just don't eat too much sugar, don't eat too much fat, just exercise every day, just save every month from your salary, every single one of those would become a habit, we would do it, there would be no problem. And every single person here, I would bet, has failed at least one of those, because we all do. So if you uh, accept that this is an imperfect world, and that you are imperfect, we'll get on very well. Uh, they do say perfection uh, is the enemy of done. I like that a lot. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice will make you better. Perfect will give you nothing but heartache and disillusionment. <laughs> you will never be perfect, and you'll never be perfect at this. We are all works in progress, as are all the people that we work with. So just to... Uh, let me not get ahead of myself. <laughs> So the problem with the human brain is that we want instant gratification. We don't want to play the long game. And we can't help that. We're wired like that, which is why we're not very good at long-term thinking, long-term saving, pensions contributions, anybody, especially if you're under 30, people tend not to do it. Uh, these are things that we know we're not very good at. Um, and the reason we're not very good at it is because the brain wants instant gratification right now. And whatever you're doing, it will want that instant gratification straight away. So we're going to look at um, <laughs> we're going to look at the habit as a whole thing, and we're going to look at why it takes debilitating levels of decision making every single day to change your behaviour, and not just your behaviour, but those of your teams that you're working with. This is why people are <sighs> resistant to change. We call it that, don't we? People are resistant to change. I can't help this team change. They just don't want it. That's fair enough. You know, what are we offering them that's really worthwhile? So we're going to be looking at those kind of things. Um, a few tips here. Uh, breaking a bad habit is much harder than building a new habit. However, <laughs> building a new habit is not that easy either. <laughs> so um, first things first, I want to talk to you about a little bit about some nice mental health stuff. Be kind to yourself. Who here, and I'll put my hand up first, who here uses a voice for themselves in their head that they would never ever use for their mother, for their child, for their grandparent? 
don't use that voice. <laughs> don't use that voice in your head. Don't listen to it. It is not helpful. We need to be as kind to ourselves. You will fail at this. You will fail often, and that's okay. By having a, an awareness of this, a self-awareness, but an awareness of this um, sort of model, this psychological map, you are way ahead of the curve already, and that self-awareness will help you be better anyway. So be forgiving of yourself. There's enough stuff out there. So a habit. Let's talk about habit. A habit is a non-deliberate practice. <coughs> um, it's non-deliberate in as much as it happens anyway, when we're, whether you're under pressure or not. And it's easy to do something consciously when you've got no pressure on you, but when you're rushed, when you're under pressure, this is when a team's habits, good habits of stand-ups and retrospectives and uh, good practices all go out of the window because they're under that pressure. <coughs> so I'm going to give you some examples during this. They're nice, hopefully non-specific examples that you'll all understand. So for example, when I say habits are things you do when you're under pressure, who here has never, ever woken up late because they forgot to set the alarm, the alarm didn't go off, they were on a Tuesday and they should have been on a Wednesday or whatever? Everybody has been late, but you never, ever, no matter how late you were, no matter what you forgot to do, you did not forget to get dressed or brush your teeth or brush your hair. You know, I have gone out once many, many years ago with odd shoes on, but that was just, that was just me and just one time, and they were very close in colour. But you don't forget to do the things you always do. So you don't forget to brush your teeth. You don't forget to brush your hair. You just do it as fast as you possibly can to get out. And that's what we're talking about. We want our, our teams, even when they're under pressure with deadlines, because, you know, this is not a perfect world, we want them to still stick to their good, agile habits. And the way to do that is build them into habits so that there's stuff that they always do without thinking. So who has heard, shout out for me, how many times you have to do something before it becomes a habit? 12? 21? 38? Oh, 30 days, okay. <laughs> 22? Okay, sorry, 40. Okay, so <laughs> I've heard everything from once to 100 times when I've done this. I've never heard 22, and you, didn't say, you said 30 days, didn't you? 22. All of those are right. The same as one. You can do something once, and from then on, it's a habit. And the reason that that's the case is because it depends how long it takes for you to change your psychological makeup. And that's the bit we're going to be looking at. You can't just do something 21 times, 22 times, 12 times, whatever, and da-da, we're all fixed. It's not that easy. Sorry. <laughs> it really isn't that easy. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at some, today some real-life habits and think about how that works. So... When we're talking of habits for agile <coughs> teams, what kind of things can we mean? Ceremonies. Ceremonies, okay. That's fine. So I've got things like they prefer pair working. That's their default position. They'll go to pair working. They always have a three amigos before they kick off a story or something along those lines. They um, always on time for a stand-up. You're going to hear that example a lot here. That'll be the, the example I use most often. Being on time for stand-up, really great habit. Offer help when it's needed. So these are the habits that help people to work in an agile way. This is the root of agile working, in my mind, is just a series of habits about the way in which we work. So a habit, we said, was something that we do anyway, regardless of what's going on. And we do it no matter how time pressured we are. So we've got this massive deadline, and yet we still stop for a retrospective. We have this massive deadline, and we don't just keep working. We do stop and do our stand-ups. How do we get it so that that is stuff that we just do anyway? Because that's not easy. So what I'd like you to do, this is the first exercise. Sorry, I'm not doing very well with it. This will go completely out the window, by the way, but we'll give it a go. Um, what I'd like you to do in your teams is have a discussion and come up with one probably of the worst habits you can think of that you've seen. Now, if you're going to use a real-life habit, uh, we need the disclaimer on here that obviously everything here is any relationship or similarities between people living or dead is completely fictional and arbitrary and coincidental. Um, I don't want anyone to get into trouble. This is being recorded. But if you have experiences and you'd like to use a real-life experience, this will make this much easier for you. So I'm going to give you... 
five-ish maybe minutes to have a talk and come up with a bad habit, a bad agile habit that you've seen that really annoys you. Okay, are you done now? This is where you find that somebody else has got the one you've just chosen and all that conversation. Do you want to start here? What is the one you're going to choose for your bad habits? Okay, so physically present, not actually engaged. Okay. Is it just stand-ups? Let's do stand-ups. Okay. You guys. Changes mid-sprint. Mid okay. Is that scope changes or commitment changes? <laughs> changes on a whim, my favorite kind. <laughs> Updating. Okay, so poor admin, is that fair or is that not right, what you mean? Okay. Okay, I'm trying to think of a way to, s so that's like poor communication. Okay. Okay, you guys. Bad est what do we mean by bad estimations? They're not very accurate or they are deliberately... Well, they guess when they, when they came in and then they like re-estimate the children and say, you know, they're completely wrong. So they investigate further and realise actually it's not loads of their original that they re-estimate. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's a whole workshop in its own right. Yeah. <laughs> I am going to try really hard not to get sidetracked. If anybody sees me getting sidetracked through there, can you just shout? Because... It's a whole rabbit hole I could not go down. Okay, <laughs> we will never get this finished if I do. Okay, so we've got, I've got four examples up there and you've got more on your table. So you feel free to work through this on your table in the same way as I'm going to do here. That table space, if you want to keep that clear or fill of stickies or whatever, absolutely fine. You may find that some of the ones you've got there will be easier for you to work through than some of the ones we've got up here. The other thing is, is when we're talking about bad habits, there are two kinds of bad habits. So the bad habits are always, when we're talking about habits, we're talking about the behaviour element. So we've got something, we'll talk about this in a minute, something called the cue. You've got the behaviour that we're talking about and then the reward at the end. The behaviour, when I talk about the word habit, in this workshop, I'm talking about the behaviour in here. But the habit actually is really all of it. When you're talking about habits, this is the bit that you're usually talking about as well. This is the behaviour. So when we're talking about bad habits, there are two kinds of bad habits. There is undesirable behaviour, behaviour that we don't want. So that would be when we correct a toddler for shouting or for hitting. That's a behaviour that we don't want. But there is also the absence of good behaviour. Um, not engaged in stand-ups is possibly an absence of good behaviour. What we want is them engaged, the re them to understand why it's important. Changes mid-sprint, is that an absence of behaviour, of good behaviour, or is that an actively bad behaviour? Okay. Uh, that's very interesting. It depends what the cue is on that, so we can discuss that later. Poor communication, absence of good behaviour, or is that actively bad behaviour? Undesirable bad behaviour. Uh, Okay, yeah, I'll give you that. Yes. Okay, so that's fair enough. The, the both of those would be the same. So, and again, poor estimates. Is that actively bad behaviour? Uh, is that undesirable behaviour? Or is that behaviour that is good behaviour that's missing? I think it's right. And what's really interesting there is 
most of you identified that it, it depends. It depends on the context. And that would be our cue. So we're going to talk a little bit about cues now. So when you hear me say cue, I sometimes use the word trigger. They are interchangeable. So a habit is made up of these three things. There is a cue, there is the behavior that we're talking about, and then there is the reward. And we'll get to the reward much later. But the cue here is about the thing that made the bad behavior happen. And we're going to talk about bad behavior. When I say bad behavior, again, it could be the absence of good behavior, but it could also be that this is just undesirable behavior that's coming out. So it's only part of the story, however. I don't know where to put these. Um, so I said I'd use some examples. So the example I'm going to use is stand-up. Uh, you've got not engaged in stand-ups. I'm going to say, in my little example, not turning up for a stand-up on time. That's been one of my bugbears in my early days. It used to drive me insane. Why can you just not rock up at a stand-up at 9 o'clock like we agreed or whatever? Um, and there's the reason for that. And the reason is, is that there is a cue that makes a behavior happen. So if it's an absence of behavior, you need a cue that's going to trigger the behavior that you want. If it is bad behavior that um, we need to change, there is a trigger that makes that bad behavior happen. There is a thing that sets it off. So when we think about people not showing up for a stand-up, there could be reasons why. Can anybody give me reasons why you would or wouldn't show up for a stand-up? What could be triggers for that? Possibly. Sorry? Traffic jam. Traffic jam, okay. That would be a one-off, though. So this would be repeatable bad behavior would be a habit, wouldn't it? Don't see the value in it. That's really <laughs> common. They're more concerned about the work that they're doing. Ah. Okay. So try and avoid about it. Okay, yeah, they don't want to be transparent and open. Yep, fair enough. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you three possible triggers for what could make somebody maybe go to their stand-up on time. So one would be they come in the morning and uh, they go, they make their coffee, and it's about stand-up time, so they take the coffee and they go and wait in the stand-up area and everyone else joins them. Okay, they're on time for their stand-up. Woohoo! Um, maybe they come in early, they work at their desk for a while, but when Joe comes in, he takes his coat off, he makes coffee, and they know that that's about the time that we do stand-up. Joe jo always comes in just before stand-up, and that would be a trigger. Um, another trigger might be that they have a reminder on their computer that pops up that says, hey, it's stand-up time. Do you? <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> um, so, of those, which one of those three triggers do you think is the strongest? Because not all triggers are created equal. So I said that maybe I make my coffee and go straight to stand-up. Maybe I go to stand-up when Joe comes in, and maybe I have a computer alert that tells me it's time to stand-up. Getting the coffee? Getting the coffee? Joe comes in? Computer alert. OK, so with a computer alert, has anybody seen an alert come up on their computer, hit return to get rid of it without even recognizing that it's there. Never. <laughs> Never happens, does it? I can do it so smoothly now that I swear blind the computer's broken. Um, the other thing is Joe comes in. What happens if Joe's on holiday? What if Joe leaves? That's not as strong. Something that you do every day is a much stronger trigger for something else that you want to do every day. So the first tip I can give you is building on top of habits that already happen is really, really strong. Relying on somebody else, not quite so strong, which is why Scrum Masters who say, everybody stand up. It's fine initially, but that's not a long-term solution to getting your team to always do stand up. I always say Scrum Masters go on holiday to test their team. What happens when your Scrum Master is not there? And that's why it's how much of this has become habit and how much of this is just being doing what you're told because somebody's reminded you. Um, the computer alert, I mean, it's just not going to happen. Um, eventually, you're busy, you're too busy, it's come up, you've gone, yeah, I've got to stand up, I'll just finish this email. And you've pressed return, or whatever it is to get rid of that alert, and your brain is still doing the email that you were doing, 
and then it goes on to the next thing and it forgets that it was supposed to do something else. And that's just fine, that's normal, but don't rely on it. Just before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'd like you to do next for our next exercise is I'd like you to think of for each one of those where you've got whatever your bad habit is that you chose, you're going to use your imaginations or maybe use a scenario in real life and think of what the cue is that makes that bad habit happen. Okay, so I gave you good, you know, reasons that somebody might show up for a, a stand up but there are also reasons that they wouldn't show up for a stand-up. So what I want to do is come up with reasons, triggers, that would mean that they're not engaged in stand-ups. So that's quite a difficult thing, okay? Can I help you with that at all? So if somebody's not engaged in stand-up, why would they not be engaged in stand-up? They don't see any value in it? I think that would be... It takes too long, maybe. They would rather be doing the work instead of doing the meeting. God, I hear that so often. Um, so what we're looking for is, what is it? They, they're showing up because they're being told to, ultimately, if they're not engaged. So what is it that we can perhaps think about and say, well, this is, this is why they're showing up. This is what they're showing up. This is what makes them go to the stand-up. The fact they're not engaged is the problem that we need to fix. <coughs> that one's going to be difficult, sorry. So you may want to pick one of your others. <laughs> uh, changes mid-sprint, poor comms, poor estimates. What triggers these things to happen? Why would somebody give a poor estimate? They're going to do the work. Why would they give a poor estimate? What makes them give a poor estimate? Poor comms. What, what is it that means that it's... I, I try not to put the words out there for you. What is it that makes them not bother to communicate? That's an absence of behaviour. You again, you guys, because of an absence of behaviour, it's harder to find a cue for an absence of behaviour. You may want to swap that one. Or change the context so that you specifically say, in this circumstance, we're not doing something. Okay? I'll give you five minutes. And I know it's hard. It will get easier once you get the hang of it. So what I'm going to do is leave you... Several of you have changed, which is absolutely fine, so I'm going to abandon this up here, and I'm going to leave you with building your things out on your um, tables so that you can see. Um, I'll hand out some handouts in a minute so you can see the shape of a nice chart that you could do if you wanted. Um, so what was really interesting, when you were looking for triggers for your bad behaviour, it's really hard to find a trigger for a behaviour that doesn't exist, where your behaviour is a bad behaviour and it's an absence of a good behaviour. Finding a trigger for that is really difficult. The other thing that was really interesting and consistent is, I think, not quite everybody, but nearly everybody had fear down as one of their triggers. That's really, really important because that is often the root cause for some reason or other People are afraid. Imagine. They're afraid of all sorts of things, but fear as a root cause for why somebody behaves poorly is really, really common. And so that would be, if I was saying to you as a shorthand, nice heuristic, start with fear and see if they could be afraid of anything before you worry about any of the other triggers. That's a really uh, common one. If you're stuck, think about it from that point of view. Okay, so we've talked a bit about cues and we'll come back to them later on. I was saying earlier... Uh, to one team, that it feels like this is something that is peripheral, but it's, it's really not. You have absolutely no control over the behaviour of somebody else. You have very little control, to be fair, over your own behaviour. We'll come to that later on as well. You have no control over the reward somebody gets for that behaviour. It feels like you can affect that. We'll just give people sweets, we'll give people money, Anybody heard of bonuses in the banking sector? Do you know they don't work? This is because behaviour and reward are really, really closely linked internally inside for somebody, and you can't break that connection. But the one thing that we have massive power over is the trigger and the cue. You can affect that, which is why we will come back to that, and we'll do some more on that in a minute. Okay. But in order to complete this, we're going to talk very briefly about uh, rewards. So, I said you don't really have any control over it. You don't really. Um, there are... 
when you're talking about new behaviours, when you're building a new habit, and you were talking up here about not engaged people, somebody not being engaged in a stand-up, the best question to ask is if they're missing a, a reason, if they're missing a behaviour that you want, think to yourself, what's in it for me? If I was them, what's in it for me? Why would I go to stand-up? Because they're not seeing any value in it. Somebody actually said that. There's no value in it for them. So the only way that you would ever change that behaviour is to find a way of giving them some value because that's their problem. So they, have, they get absolutely zero reward. So you need to find a way of giving them a reward that helps you get that behaviour because you can't make them do the behaviour usefully. They'll show up, but they won't actively engage. They won't participate. Um, with an existing behaviour we were talking about it's much easier to find cues for that. With an existing behaviour, we're talking about rewards over here. An existing behaviour, somebody is getting a reward, even for bad behaviour. So when people resist change in an organisation, we don't want to do this agile rubbish. I have had people say that to me in stronger words than that. Um, they are getting a reward out of not doing the agile thing, out of being resistant. So you think of the pain and the anguish and the general disarray that they cause by being difficult, they are still getting a reward out of that. So even if it's causing them pain and aggro, they are still getting a reward out of it. Even if that reward is just the fact that they don't have to put the effort into changing. So change is hard, constant. I said it was debilitating level of decision making. Making a change to yourself and the way that you behave is really, really hard work. And that's if you've got a reward. So when we're talking about rewards, we're talking about the limbic part of the brain, the old, old part of the brain. Before we even branched off and started to become mammals, this bit of our brain already existed. And this bit of our brain has a very unusual sense of reward. So it's not obvious what a reward would be. And I'd like to give you an example. So, I bite my nails. Sometimes, not all the time. Right now, they're not so bad. You won't be able to see. They're not so bad. And I thought about this as a really good example. Why do I only bite my nails sometimes? Why would I bite my nails at all, for God's sake? I mean, it's a ridiculous habit. And it turns out, if my nails grow a bit and I have a little bit of a corner on there, it drives me insane. And I will pick at it, pick at it, pick at it until the, the nail has come away and then I have to bite it off because it drives me nuts. No, it's ridiculous. And it's a reward ha because there's no more corner on my nail. That's how twisted this bit of your brain is, okay? It is not logical. You're looking for a reward that makes the problem go away. So I have a cue, I have a trigger, which is that corner on my nail. I have a behaviour, which is biting my nail. And the reward is I don't have that corner anymore. Now, how twisted is that? It's really stupid. However... I can get the reward, which is no corner on my nail, if I carry a bloody nail file with me and use it. And suddenly, I don't have bitten nails anymore. That's a really easy way of explaining to you how you can use, you can affect the cue, the trigger, but you cannot affect the reward. Okay, so rewards are difficult, especially for things like where the cue is fear, the reward might just be avoiding that difficult and scary place. So you need to keep looking when you're looking for it. It can be really weird. Um, and don't underestimate inertia. The fact that somebody doesn't have to change is a reward in itself. The fact that somebody doesn't have to put any effort in is a reward. Um, this can sometimes be power trips, particularly, which is, I'm a really big, important DBA. I don't have to do what you say with your whole agile stuff. So just flow round me like a rock in a river. It'll be fine. I'm not doing this thing. And that will still count as a reward for them. Um, it can be really hard to find generic examples. <laughs> and you're going to try and do that now. It's going to be difficult, I know. Try really hard. Use your imagination. This doesn't have to be real. But what could the reward be for somebody who is demonstrating one of your bad behaviours? Can you imagine a reward that they would get out of displaying that bad behaviour. Okay? I'm going to give you a few minutes. So I wandered around and I handed out green or black and white versions of this sheet. This is, if you want to take this away, you can. It would help you do this again in real life. The numbers are kind of, sort of right. Not quite. 
because I changed the order of the workshop to make it slightly easier, I thought. Um, so just before we move on from rewards, because we just you've done rewards, you've got some rewards. Everybody I've seen has got something resembling um, some reward ideas for their poor behaviours. I did want to talk about the law of unintended consequences. So if you go around and you try and affect the reward, which you see all over the place, lots of people will go and try and do this. I have a story. Uh, any, has anybody here seen me speak before? Okay, I have a very dear colleague and friend who called Melissa. People will have heard me talk about her before. And she gave me this story to share with you because she went, oh my, when I was telling her about this workshop, she went, oh my God, let me tell you a story. She used to work years ago in a team and they had uh, a system that said, do you know what? We've got this big jelly belly, uh, jelly bean machine. And what we're going to do is we're going to motivate our teams. Whoever turns out the most story points at the end of a sprint gets the jelly belly machine on their desk for the next sprint. Okay, so this is, you know, confectionery driven development. I've seen it work successfully or at least have a go. Um, what do you think happened as a result of that simple decision to reward the team that had done so well putting story points out? They doubled their estimates and the story points per sprint went up by everybody. Very, not even very gradually, relatively quickly, but not, you know, they didn't double overnight, but they went up really significantly. Because if you just overestimate each story, well, you're going to do more story points and... People didn't even do this deliberately. People do this by accident, subconsciously. So there is always an unintended consequence if you start messing around with this stuff. Just be aware of it because it's, uh, it's, it's out there. Okay, so we're now going to move on a little bit. So we're going to move on to the cool stuff now, which is what can I do about this stuff? Okay, so here is our behavior, our golden behavior. This is the behavior that we want. So we're going to talk about this. When we're talking about this today, now, for the rest of the session, this might be a bad behavior that you want to change into a better behavior, or it might be a behavior that you want to instill that hasn't been there before. So we've talked a little bit about cues, and I'm going to give you some things that you can use in order to affect the cues. So I did say the cues and triggers were the most effective way of changing this. So you'll see down there, two of our favourite friends, anybody who's ever tried to diet, exercise, or any of those things, motivation and willpower. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little, little bit about these. So on your sheets in front of you, you'll see that motivation is down there as the why. This is why would I do this? And this can help when you're trying to instill a new habit with a what's in it for me? Why would I do this? So you can change that um, you have some control over, over what you are motivating somebody with. But motivation will only take them so far and they have to want something. So you have to find out what it is that's going to motivate a particular team member or a particular team. And that's going to be difficult. Um, and then willpower. So in fact, let's talk a little bit about motivation more before we go on to willpower. So... When you're talking about motivation, I did say you'll need to know what motivates your team member or your team. You need to be really clear. It needs to be crystal clear in your mind what is in it for them. Why would they do this? And they need to understand what they're going to get out of it. You may not have to explicitly say it to them, but they need to know. If they are unclear of why they would do something, then the at best you're going to get is compliance, which is lack of engagement at the end of the day. This is also... Um, I refer to it as the anti-venom for getting somebody or yourself to do something they don't want to do. So you find a reason for them to do it. So if you want to go on for exercise, you need something really motivating to get yourself up at 5 a.m. to go out for a run or whatever. You need that in your head. Some people find that much easier than others. But motivation will need to be strong the more unpleasant that you don't want to, the, the task that you need to do. Um, and the thing about motivation is it'll only ever take you from zero to one. So if you're going from naught to 100 in steps, motivation will only get you off the bottom step. Literally, that one. And then along comes its friend, willpower. Willpower is not your friend. Willpower gives you the illusion 
of being permanent when really it's just temporary. It's debilitating, hard work, and you exhaust your, your uh, resources of it really, really quickly, which is why you may have heard studies that say if you're going in front of a judge, make sure you go in front of the judge in the morning and not the afternoon because they make poorer decisions. More people go to prison in the afternoon than they do in the morning. It's because the judge has had decision fatigue. It's harder. Um, the other thing that we talk about willpower and motivation is it will get you to the behaviour that you want very, very slowly. But it's not a direct route. It would be nice if these two joined up and went straight there. But actually what happens is this. You have rinse and repeat over and over and over again. For every single step you take, you need to find some motivation, you need to find some willpower, and you need to execute that. And the way to get there is by giving yourself a reward for every single one of those little steps. So tiny, tiny rewards every single way, every single time that you've done one of those things. Um, and what you can do is if you want to start an exercise regime, for example, step one might be put your trainers on and declare victory. That, it's that small. It has to be really tiny and you have to be almost impossible to fail. Because if it's hard, you won't do it. And you need to forgive yourself and you're going to fall off this a lot. And this is co what's commonly known in the trade as hard work. And unfortunately, a large amount of habit building is hard work. There's no getting away from that, and I need to be really clear. There are some shortcuts and there are some other tools that we can use, but this is still your bedrock. So the trick is to make sure that you have got lots and lots and lots of small steps with little rewards at the end of it. And what does that sound like? <laughs> it is effort. But it also sounds like taking an epic and breaking it down into stories and delivering small pieces of valuable work a bit at a time. The other thing I would say about this is for every single one of these tiny uh, things, if you are expecting to do hard work, and you're going to get your teams to do hard work, make sure that you finish on a high. So if you were, let's go back to our exercise thing because I seem to have got stuck on this now. If you are going to say, I'm going to do start by putting my trainers on and eventually I'm going to run a minute and then I'm going to run two minutes and then I'm going to run 10 minutes or whatever it is and you're going to build up in small sections. On your little running machine, you're going to run your sprint not at the end. You're going to run your sprint just before the end. So when you get to the end, you have slowed down enough. What you're trying to do is get your endorphins to kick in to make sure that you get a reward before you finish your bad bit. So this bit here with the hard work, it's about tricking your brain into thinking you like this. This is a good thing. So you've done, your, you've, you've done a bit of running, you've done your sprint, and then you slow it down a little bit. Now, the, some people use that as a cool down. But the idea is, is that you're finishing on a high. You're trying really hard to make sure that there is a reward almost before you finish the task. This is hard work in the This is... <laughs> okay, so, and exactly right. So you need to understand their motivation and you need to understand... You need to get them engaged so that they will use their own willpower. You cannot... Uh, use your willpower to force someone else to do things for very long. You certainly won't get them all the way there. And this is why they say, you know, if you want to exercise, if you want to lose weight, you have to do it. You have to want to do it. Um, but there are other things that we can do. Um, so this, um, um, the reason I'm laboring this is because I really don't want you to think that this is going to be just, well, that's easy. I just do this now. Because if it was that easy, believe me, we wouldn't be here. Um, but there are other things. So, there are other ways to affect this behaviour. There is fear. Every single one of you came out with fear as a motivation, as a reason why somebody... Yes, yeah, sorry, exactly right. A, a trigger or a cue. A reason why somebody would behave poorly. Fear, you can affect somebody to change their behaviour using fear, but because we are at an Agile conference and, frankly, nice human beings... We're not going to talk about that. It's really, really powerful, and the human brain will do far more to avoid something that it's afraid of than it will do to move towards something that it wants. This is really powerful, but it's not sustainable, and it's not a nice way to work, so we're going to move away from that. There is also something called epiphany. 
So, has anybody, ah, oh, I don't know, stopped smoking, just stopped like that. Has anybody, yeah, so, I did too, <laughs> many years ago. Um, sometimes, something happens, and your world changes, and you just stop a bad habit, or you just start a new habit. This, this is a direct route to changing your behavior. It's really hard to get these engineered, and it's probably a workshop in its own right. I'm not going to try and engineer epiphany into the world right now. But the other one we can talk about. And the other one is brain. OK, is crisis. Now, when I'm talking about crisis, I'm not talking about the world is ending. I'm talking about a big, massive change in somebody's status quo, the way things that normally are. That crisis change is something else that you can use. Um, and this is really powerful to use in a company with a team, and it can be, it's a sliding scale. So the bigger the crisis, the more plastic our brains will become. If there is a crisis, people can see that it's a crisis, their brains become more plastic because they are now expecting change. And you can slide a shed load of change in where you wouldn't normally be able to do that. And people are much more accepting of it. So I'm going to give you some examples of crises. And you're going to engineer <laughs> some of yourselves in a moment. So, personal crises, moving house, becoming a parent, becoming a potential parent, moving offices, moving teams, moving desks, sliding scale. Uh, you've got a new senior manager, a new CTO. Um, new CTO we had recently, forming, storming, norming, performing at scale, I can tell you, in a new uh, in a tech team. Um, but many crises you can engineer. So you would have, I have shamelessly used all of these. Um, you would use the new year or a new season or a new month to say, do you know what, from now on we're going to do, or let's do a retrospective or let's do a future perspective. Let's think about how we want our team to work for the next year. So new year, New Year's resolutions, let's think about that. Um, you have a new starter in the team or a disruptive member of the team moves out of that team or out of the company those are all watershed moments. They're moments that you can take and you can use that moment to say, everybody's expecting change. Let's get together as a team and decide how we want that change to work. And with a bit of uh, choreography, you can help the team come up with some really useful ways in which they can grow and adapt. But a new, new scrum master even joining a team is great too. That gives you the opportunity to make some changes. The bigger the crisis, the more plastic our brains are. And it's to do with the brains accepting the, cha um, expecting the change, and you need to seize on the opportunity. So we moved offices recently, well, not so recently now, 18 months ago, and I ran around for the whole six months beforehand going, we're going to move offices, we should be using this. Let's use this as a big change point, because absolutely huge. As soon as you know that there's a big change coming in your life, if you move jobs, the best time to start a new exercise regime is when you change jobs because your brain is expecting change. So the first day of a new job, first day of a new routine. And if you are looking, I could just give you this tip now because I'm talking about it. If you are looking to build a new habit, the best thing to build a new habit on, the best cue or trigger to build a new habit on is an existing habit. And you can stack habits so that if you brush your teeth and then you go down and have breakfast, you could also tag in the I'm going to read more, so I'm going to pick up a blog and I'm going to read a blog in the morning while I drink my coffee rather than watch the news. So you can change your habits by using habits that already exist. So you have to use some willpower and motivation initially, and then you have to keep doing it for a while, but you're using your trigger is an existing habit. Okay? So, I would like you, if you don't mind, to have a go... So you'll see on the sheets there that there is spaces for engineering yourself a crisis. Um, I would like you to see if, with your examples down here, you can think of a crisis that you could use. How could you use it? So this is proper work now. <laughs> this is not just hard work. This is actually creatively proper work. What, cri what crisis could you engineer in order to solve or to start to solve, or to create an environment where you could start to solve the problem that you have on your stickies. Okay, so is everybody done? Okay, 
we've only got a few more minutes, so I'm going to talk to you um, about the last few, few things. So, <sighs> making a habit stick is quite difficult too, surprisingly enough. Human brains are really not uh, the most simple software ever devised. Um, so, to make a habit stick, if you wanted to change someone's behaviour, we, I've given you some examples. Can anybody else think of something that I haven't said yet that would be a really obvious way of making somebody stop doing something they currently do? Okay, yeah. So just conscious awareness. Cool. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, physically removing the trigger. So if you take the trigger away, then you're going to be in a position where that behavior is much less likely to happen. <laughs> Again, I think that's down to the fear one, which we weren't going to talk about. <laughs> um, so, the other thing that we can do is change the behavior for the trigger by giving them the same reward for the same trigger, but trying to change their behavior in the middle. Do you remember I said that was really difficult? If you can think about it as... Um, how to explain this? So... When we're talking about uh, habits, the things that make people really change their behavior are well known. They're used really uh, extensively in things like the gambling industry. So they can make us build new habits really well. They're very, very good at it. Um, this is because they're using um, dopamine. Now, dopamine is often called the pleasure chemical. That's not quite true. It is a chemical in the brain that it anticipates, uh, it, you get lots of dopamine hits when you're anticipating a reward, not for the reward itself. So does anybody know about, there was an experiment years ago done with, um, they taught a pigeon to peck to get food. Peck a, uh, what they found was if they only occasionally gave it food, it pecked way more often than a pigeon who got food every single time. And the reason for that is because the anticipation of that reward is far stronger than the reward itself. So, <laughs> If we can find something that makes us uh, turn the page of a book and keep turning that page of a book, even though we need to go to sleep and it's 2 o'clock in the morning and we've got to be up at 6, and yet we keep reading that book, that's that dopamine hit coming through. So what we're looking for here is a way of saying, I need to find a way of getting a person who gets the reward that we've identified from their behavior, from the their behavior with this trigger, all we need to do is give them that reward for different behavior. So if a, a director, for example, constantly wants to know about, I want all my reports, I want my reports on my desk on Monday morning, I don't care um, if you've not got all the figures there, but that's when I want my report, he's got a trigger for that, and his trigger probably is, is that he wants to be prepared for a 11 o'clock meeting, and therefore he wants his figures in front of him because it makes him feel confident and safe to go and face the execs. So, if we can say, well, hang on a minute, we can give you the certainty and confidence facing those execs in a different way, then that would have a, an ability for us to change his behavior. That will take us a lot longer to discuss, but I just want you to understand that that's an option, but that's, again, with the hard work bit down here. So, we were talking about the other thing there is... Um, on that sheet there, as you'll see, there's a prepare to fail. So, if then, I've called it. So, this is something that is, do you remember I said at the beginning, you will fail, we are human, this is not optional, it just happens. You're going to try something, you're going to guess what somebody's, um, you're going to look at somebody's behaviour, you're going to try and guess what reward they're getting out of it, you're going to try and find out what the cue is, their trigger is for doing that, and you're going to get it wrong. Okay? So, you're going to try and influence it, and it's not going to work. So what you need is a plan B. So you're, that's the if-then section of this. So if this happens, then I'm going to do that. So that you're not caught out when that goes wrong. So I'm literally going to give you two minutes just to talk about it rather than come up with it. But if you look at some of your rewards there, or in fact, you could look about some of your scenarios all the way across, and say, if I was going to be wrong about this, how would I be wrong? What, what, in what way could I be wrong about this? 
and what could I do about it? How could I mitigate that? What could be my plan B? So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to talk about it, not to actually solve any solutions, but think about in what ways you can be wrong, because planning to be wrong will help you be ready and not caught off balance, because when it goes wrong, and it will, having a plan B ready in your back pocket, or at least knowing that this is expected or anticipated, will make you feel better about the failure, because all you've done is take a step back. You haven't failed completely. So you need to be able to keep going, and you will lose your motivation. This is as much about you getting into the habit of building great habits with your team. You're going to fail too. So you need to be able to keep going. OK, take two minutes, because we're going to run out of time. OK, right. So I can give you tips and tricks now, or we can ask questions, and then I can give you tips and tricks and stuff. So anybody got any questions? Because we've kind of done most of the work I wanted to cover now. No questions. So, I'm going to give you the takeaways, remind you. Approach this technique, all these techniques, with kindness, both for yourself and for others. Change is not easy. And this is the tip of the iceberg. If you want to delve down or geek out with me about it later, I am really excited about all of this. Not everybody is. I get that. Be kind to yourself, especially because you're going to fail. Um, in the nicest possible way, you will also succeed. I should say that as well. You will also succeed. And it will be that wonderfully pleasant, surprising, oh my god, that actually worked. Um, enjoy it, <laughs> please. Um, it's not luck. It will be down to your hard work and to the knowledge and skills that you've got now. Habit stack. Um, build onto habits you already have. Build onto habits the team already have. Put in one rock solid habit and then build on top of that. So for example, we have. We were talking about stand-ups earlier. If you can get your stand-ups so they happen really, really well, but you cannot get your product owner to be available whenever you need them, we did a simple thing, which was tag on a half an hour at the end of our stand-up, and we did a mini show and tell for any stories that had been finished the previous day, and we did any story breakdowns, if we needed to do that, three amigos, in that time slot, because that's what worked. So we took a habit that we already had and built on top of it. So you can... Make sure you flex these rules. Make sure you do whatever it is you need to be successful because you can always change it once people see the value in it. Um, replacing an, a bad habit with more desirable behavior is much easier than just stopping somebody doing something. So taking a behavior out is really hard. You can remove the cue of the trigger, which will help you do some of it, but actually it's much easier if you leave the trigger in place and you find a way of adapting that behavior. That's really hard because the only thing that you can really control is their perception, okay? Um, prepare to fail. I think I might have said that once or twice. Use the if then to help you deal with that failure. You then, it's not a big surprise. You're not going to um, feel like everything's broken. You need to, to know what to do next. And I always think having a plan B is a really good idea. And forgive yourself. I may have mentioned that several times. The other thing is, is when you're looking for habits and rewards, keep looking because rewards are twisted. They're weird things and they are deep in the limbic brain and they may not make sense to the person, never mind to you. So a reward can be a very strange thing. Don't worry if it is, it still is. So you find a way of getting that person that reward. Okay, so some tips and tricks. I was just talking to a lady over there. Um, Get people to sign on for experiments rather than ask them to change permanently. We're going to try this new thing for three sprints. On this date, we're going to talk about how well it's gone, what you liked and what you didn't like, and whether we're going to keep going with it. People will be much more likely to, con to commit to that sprint, to that, sorry, that experiment for three sprints than they would be to change permanently. People will change permanently with minimum resistance as soon as they see what's in it for them. So initially, to get it off the starting blocks, you might want to just do that initial, let's try an experiment, let's try something. I might be wrong, try it. Um, remember the law of unintended consequences. If you're trying to change someone's behavior, you may be changing it for the worse, not for the better. So whatever it is that you're looking for can be gained, and people will take the path of least resistance, and maximum reward if they change. Don't try and change all the things at once because people can't. They can't change all that. So pick your biggest problem and focus on that first. And as soon as that's not your biggest problem anymore, relax, turn around, and look at the next one. 
Um, habit stack, so once you've got a good habit, build another one on top of it. But simplicity is your friend here. So start with easy. Um, I would say as well, know your audience. So try and think in advance if it's going to work. So the techniques you would use with a team are different to the techniques you would use with management and directors. So think about your audience and think about what motivates them, not what would motivate you. It's really easy to put yourself in their shoes as yourself. And it's not your motivation for something. You know, we've all said, why the hell would you do that? Everybody said that at some point. And the truth is, is that's because you wouldn't. But somebody else somewhere has a motivation that would make it really important for them. Uh, buddies. Okay, so everybody's had got a voice in their head somewhere that tells them, every time they go to do something, they have a voice in their head where somebody in the past has said over and over again. So for me, I have a voice in my set head that says something along the lines of, um, what problem is it you're trying to solve? And that's an old boss of mine who used to start, and now I say it so much that people hear my voice when they think of that phrase. What problem are you trying to solve? So when somebody comes to you with a big question, it's like, what is it you're trying to actually do here? So when you hear those voices in your head, somebody has changed your behavior by using repetitive this bit over and over and over again. That's the hard work view. That's really difficult to do. It's one way, but it's not the only way. So um, it's a huge effort, but it will give you the rewards. Um, we do things with like scrum buddies, which helps people keep on track. Um, so we buddy up with somebody in the same role just to help keep ourselves accountable. So accountability partners are quite good for that kind of thing. And keeping records. So I don't know if anybody's ever done it. We've done things like keeping track of the amount of pairing that teams have done. And there's a little grid to say, I've paired with all these people this month. And keeping records sometimes helps people. There's a certain type of person, I am one of those, who loves to see a nice unbroken chain of to-dos or dones or whatever. It doesn't work for everybody. But if you know your audience, that kind of motivation to have a visible chart of how many pairings have we done, how many story breakdowns have we done, how many stories did we do which didn't have breakdowns kind of thing. You can keep track and the visible cues can help people change their behavior. Uh, it doesn't necessarily work with massively disorganized people, though, that way. So that's it. Thank you very much indeed. If anybody's got any questions, you can ask them now or quietly in a minute. Up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.